Hello, welcome to the fourth presentation in the Totem Heritage Center's History of Northwest Coast Art Speaker Series. We want to start our presentation this evening recognizing that the Totem Heritage Center is located on the traditional lands of the Tantaquan and Sanyaquan people of the Clinket First Nations. Our goal with this series is to expose students and viewers to the art and culture of the Northwest Coast First Nations. This series of six virtual presentations focuses on a variety of Northwest Coast art topics with conversations between artists and historians and educators. If you have missed any of the previous presentations, you can uh, check out our Ketchikan Museum's YouTube channel. Tonight's presentation will be followed by a Q&A with the Native Art Studies program students who are participating in this Zoom class. So tonight we have Steve Brown, who was a student of Bill Holmes, curator of Northwest Coast Art. Here's my hand. <laughs> Northwest Coast Art at the Seattle Art Museum, Native Arts Curator with the Alaska Heritage Institute, as well as an accomplished artist, teacher, and author. Steve's books, The Spirit Within, Native Visions, and Sun Dogs and Eagle Down provide insight on Northwest Coast Art. Uh, all of which we have here in the Heritage Center's library. So anyone in Ketchikan is welcome to come by and take a look. Uh, Steve has shared his knowledge and skills with students at the Heritage Center since 1979, teaching classes in carving, engraving, jewelry design, history, as well as the Island Carver's Canoe Workshop. Actually, it goes back to 77. <laughs> Good to know. Clinket visual artist, carver, and filmmaker Jackson Paulus began carving with his father, Nathan Jackson, and his work examines the constraints and potential in the desire for indigenous advancement. Jackson has worked as a visual artist under the name Stephen Jackson, Jackson Paulus, and Strong Softy, and his work has been exhibited at the Alaska State Museum, the Anchorage Museum, Artist Space, Hercules Art Studio Program, the James Gallery, Ketchikan Museums, and the Sundance Film Festival amongst others. So thank you both for joining us tonight. We're super excited about this presentation. And Jackson, are we starting with you? So. Yeah, I'll just jump into it and share a screen. Um, first of all, I'll just say, well, as I do that, or probably before I do that, and it'll distract me from sharing screen, I'll just say that I'm incredibly honored uh, to be here with Steve. Um, I grew up, uh, he says 77, I was born in 76, so um, I don't know exactly when he and my father met and he and my mother met, but it was uh, either before or right yeah. around the time I was coming into existence in any form. Yeah, so. Before, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm just appreciating that there are generational aspects to the series, and I'm yeah, very honored to... Uh, be in conversation and excited to dig in um, and have some conversations that we haven't been able to have before or that we haven't had before. So um, I'm going to go into sharing screen. Um, I will say that I'm in New York, so I'm, a, um, I'm in a different time zone. So bear, bear with me. I know Steve is also in a different time zone with an incredible rainbow. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share screen and we'll get into it if that's okay i also just want to say that um i'm, a, I'm very appreciative of the ketchikan museums the totem heritage center uh the opportunity to be around that material was really a formative experience uh, for myself and i'm looking forward to uh, talking with you all and having a dialogue with you all uh toward the end of the evening i'm you gonna too. attempt to share screen Okay. Ta -da. <laughs> so, uh, here, one of the things that happened as we as we were preparing for this is we uh, we thought of a few different directions we could take. Um, first off, I think both of our interests are are fairly omnivorous, um, <laughs> and we probably also tend to both go down rabbit holes. So I think. Some of that is will be manifest here, but we also attempted to constrain our focus um, a bit and see what we could do with allowing whatever we speak about to kind of derive from the images and the objects selected themselves. Um, 
we also, you know, earlier we had thought, okay, well, let's go from traditional to contemporary or from ancient to contemporary, maybe showing some evolution. Um, we kind of had a little dialogue around that, around, okay, from my perspective, Steve has really um, been formative in advancing our ideas around how Northwest Coast art form line, many different styles, many different attributes came to flourish um, and has really identified ways in which we can um, further our own perception to understand how that came to be. Um, but I was really hoping that we could focus on maybe eccentricity tonight, moments of eccentricity that are somehow part of what makes Northwest Coast art powerful, unique, um, et cetera, but might not exactly fit um, a closed system that kind of works to, a, to kind of expand notions and, the, and thinking through the tensions around what gets picked up, what gets adopted at any given point, and how that might kind of move against or in tension with this idea of evolution or advancement. Um, that said, we also tried to narrow our focus in terms of, you know, there are many kind of stretches with um, within Northwest Coast Art but I think here we can kind of say that the work we're focusing on in some ways is historical and at least for myself is contemporary as much as many other forms of contemporary Northwest Coast art because there's some kind of newness or undiscovered um, aspects in every kind of examination of these historical pieces, even if they are kind of laden with the bird laden with um, being called masterworks or something like that. So I just wanted to acknowledge some of that. But yeah. this piece, tell us a little bit about it. Um, it came into um, prominence fairly recently, um, right? Yeah, I think so. I forget exactly when, five or six years ago. which is recent as far as that kind of thing goes. Yeah, yeah. It's not often that something new and unknown shows up and becomes shareable through the world of all the people that pay attention to this stuff. And uh, this one was one of those. That nobody except the family of the owner, current non-native owner, knew about it, you know, maybe somebody who visited it or whatever, but in general, this was uh, not a recognized object where some of them, you know, we've been looking at them for, they've been available as it were for 150. If you, uh, yeah, we can see if we can get Steve back and, uh, if, oh, we lost him completely. If you want to, um, you want yeah, to... I can I can continue a little bit okay. on on this piece. Um, so Steve, um, so this piece, um, you know, Steve Brown has been. It's hard for me to talk about him when he's not here because he can't hear what I'm saying about him. Um, Steve is, among many things, an advisor um, and consultant historian who often allows historical input to be uh, given to these kind of pieces. Um, this piece was discovered, as he mentioned, a few years ago. Um, one of the aspects of this was that it was deemed to be extremely um, rare because it had the attributes of what some might call neoclassical work. Um, so maybe I'll just read. This was uh, Donald Ellis is a, a gallerist 
who deals in Northwest Coast art and sometimes sells uh, high value objects, sometimes comes into acquisition. And a lot of these objects um, are in institutions around the world. And it's very rare that people like you who are in Ketchikan or even myself, although I've had the privilege of being able to travel to places that have these kind of objects, um, it's very rare that we get to see them. And a lot of these pieces, we may have like a partial view in a book or something like that. So that we don't really know much about them. And, and a lot of the pieces that are in museums or are owned by private collectors that may have been published in books, then transfer on um, to other private collectors. And that kind of trail is lost and only known by a few. Steve is one of those kind of people who have the inside track due to his wealth of knowledge and his experience um, and his ability to identify and attribute pieces based on stylistic difference. So I don't know exactly what the price of this was in terms of the asking price, um, but it was acquired for a huge amount of money. Um, and a lot of these pieces are acquired in auction houses like Sotheby's or Christie's um, based in New York. I'm just going to read what he wrote <laughs> on the website. This can be found on the Do Donald Ellis website. And I think it's, um, yeah. So he says very few names. Of, and actually, this is a question. I don't know if Steve actually wrote this text. Um, it was probably a collaboration with the gallery. It says, very few names of Northwest Coast artists active in the late 18th century were ever recorded in the liter literature or oral histories. Remarkably, three surviving sources list one artist by the name Cadiz Duach II, among the Tlingit of that time. Praised as the greatest carver of wood in the history of the Tlingit people in a written narrative of his work in the Klukwan Whale House, this outstanding shaman's rattle is among the artist's most significant known works. Only recently coming to light from obscurity, the images and activities depicted are unlike any other rattle of its type. A unique vision composed on the back of an elegantly poised oyster catcher with an ivory beak. The black oyster catcher is a large Northwest Coast shorebird whose spirit and image were adopted as allies by Tlingit shamans. Some of the most impressive Tlingit shamans rattles incorporate this oyster catcher forms as aids to the spiritual work of healing and divination. In this example, on the underside of the bird sits a crisply carved face with the protruding recurved beak and wing designs on either side. The most, the most striking and unusual feature of this rattle is the near total asymmetry of the carved imagery. So this uh, asymmetry, as you can see, is on the top. I'll also say that this uh, bears similarity with, of course, raven rattles, and there is some debate in the way the raven rattles, which I'll, I guess I'll uh, talk about a little bit later, as to the proper way of or manner of holding them, whether the rattles were intended to be held upside down, like twisted, so the bird was, so the beak was facing up, so that this form line design was visible. And there's, you know, some internal debate as to reasons for that posing in historical pictures. So the primary figure appears to be a bear carved with a humanoid. Uh, that would be the bear at the bottom here. I don't know if you could see my mouse, perhaps not. A bear carved with a humanoid mouse, mouth and nose, indicating transformation between the human and animal forms. Uh, I will say that a lot of these pieces are interesting to me because the manner of describing them ends up allowing for um, a lot of conjecture. <laughs> like, what is the linkage between the human and animal forms? We like um, between forms coming in the, through the mouth. Um, we imagine that there must be something about transformation there, right? But the oral histories don't demarcate that necessarily. Atop the animal's head is an exquisitely carved eagle with its small feet curled over the bear's ears. So you can see that it looks like there's a, a little eagle in the center, and it looks like the claws of that form are uh, perched atop the bear's ears. 
Three subsidiary figures, two small humans and one bear cub, are depicted as if suckling at the teats of the bear. This may be a reference to the origin story of the woman who married a bear and gave birth to bear human offspring, although this does not seem to be commonly depicted in other objects made to serve the shamanic tradition. On the other side of the bear, an otter or possibly a wolf is shown biting the head of a large salmon. Okay, so a large salmon that curves back from the right side of the bear's mouth. It is probable that the bear, eagle, wolf, humans, and bear cub are all representations of spirit helpers drawn from specific visions experienced by the shaman. A rattling sound is said to be pleasing to the spirits. Numerous objects were created on the Northwest coast to produce this resonance. That this highly, um, that this delicately carved rattle has survived nearly intact for over 225 years is remarkable, likely due to the high degree of respect it undoubtedly commanded among generations of Tlingit peoples. It's interesting to me that it said that this this notion of it says it's probable that the bear, eagle, wolf, humans, and bear cub are all representations of spirit helper, helpers drawn from specific visions experienced by the shaman. So Kadis Duwakch, who is this famous carver, who was responsible for, I'm going to jump ahead to the the whale house and click one and carve pieces like this, this, and this, and this. Uh, these are kind of examples of why he is so highly regarded given the kind of ability to bring complexity, compactness into a, a totem pole, a design, and connect it to the clan crests in a very powerful way. Um, with also a lot of emotion, you can see a lot of emotion in the faces, faces, but still bearing kind of a having a kind of stylistic imprint that doesn't necessarily uh, foreground form line as a priority of experimentation or development. Um, one could say that his form line is very um, efficient, and uh, Steve has written a lot about this person being very efficient in terms of how they produce the designs, which also Steve himself um, learned to do and to pass on in teaching to others. Um, you can see, for example, that there's a lot of depth to this, but the carving itself is actually not that deep, um, which is uh, an attribute of other pieces, regardless of the scale. This person, um, Kadis Duakch, uh, Steve goes on to note this example on the left is of a Wrangell house post, which was done earlier, according to Steve, um, earlier than the whale house posts. This was the chief shakes post. This piece on the left was actually a reproduction done by Steve himself um, from the historical pieces done uh, pretty much exactly um, to those historical pieces, even including um, some of the asymmetry that might not be immediately evident, but that we know through um, studies of form line and the transforming image, et cetera, that was um, highly valued to keep slight moments of asymmetry to add live liveliness to a design that when people started um, using templates and kind of picking up the tradition after some loss that for a while they had kind of done exact symmetry and not realized what was lacking in those instances, that they were losing a lot of the life. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to say that Steve was also doing that with these posts. So to go back, one of the things that was interesting to me about this attribution, saying that it's probable that the these are all representations of spirit helpers drawn from visions experienced by the shaman is that in this piece, if it is Kadis Duaksh, does that mean he was also a shaman? I don't know. <laughs> or did he have some special relationship or conduit and the shaman somehow uh, communicated to this secular carver who also was able to, um, yeah, 
to the secular carver, like what is the relationship there? And that's interesting to me because I think for for Tlingit people specifically, there's a kind of difficult relationship with shamanism, of course, and you know that, that was pushed out when people began to adopt different practices and been, be encouraged to um, discard their their older practices. Um, and then there became a lot of shame around that kind of um, those kind of pieces, and a lot of them were abandoned. But then so many of them were collected by people like Emmons, and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy when when people said that the cultures were dying, so that these uh, the all these objects, tens of thousands of objects, actually needed to be collected and transported. Uh, to different uh, institutions around the world in order to save them, but actually it was creating and contributing to a larger disruption of culture that we're still not recovered from. So I think that's one of the tensions that I see when looking at shamanistic objects and knowing that there's also a lot of tension around NAGPRA, um, Native American Graves and Repatriation Act, where shamanistic objects um, were often left at grave sites, but we don't know the particulars of that. Like why were the, why they were left? Were they always left at grave sites? Were they always left at shaman's graves? Um, and Tlingit people had a different kind of relationship with shamanism. Other cultures had from further south had more secret societies, whereas the kind of arbitrary figure who pushes in different ways at the tradition was al already a kind of outcast. So to separate that further, it gets a little confusing, right? Okay. I was hoping I wouldn't have to do a monologue tonight. <laughs> but I'm, uh, this is incredible material to look at. Um, so I'm going to stick with it here. So I think it's interesting to look at um, Steve and it would be, I think this also the idea of attribution is interesting. For example, how does one, how does one articulate what are the traits of a piece? Now Steve would have very specific examples about that, uh, which he can identify through, for example, um, the eagle head on the rattle were reflecting the similarity of composition and proportion. I mean, that could be one thing. It looked, but we also know that people were influenced by each other, right? I'm not saying that um, this isn't the same person. Um, and I think it, on the one hand, you can see the value of attribution the desire to name an artist that has not been recognized. That's a, that was a very, and has been, and still is, an extremely important endeavor because it allows for Northwest Coast art or so-called primitive art to be raised to the level of, um, of Western art, I guess, so-called Western art. And on the other hand, one of the, um, downsides of that, you might say, is that it potentially narrows our idea of what any one person did or should do. That a person should have their own style and they should stick to it. Whereas somebody like Kadis Duwakch, if he did all these pieces, had a huge range and did bear some stylistic imprint. But I would also say and th this is not necessarily in the slides that I was showing tonight, um, but there was also a lot of appropriation pre-contact and during contact and a lot of influence and in copying other styles for other purposes. So I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind to remember that there were many different purposes for uh, imitation beyond upholding tradition. Wow.
Uh, this is another example of a gray item, um, which I was going to ask Steve if he thought this was also done by Kadis Duak. There are some uh, interesting um, asymmetry here as well. Whereas, of course, if you look at these, there's not that much asymmetry, right? There's there's a, a lot of symmetry. Uh, but at this one, you can see this kind of slope on the right, the right shoulder. We're viewing it on the right shoulder. Um, we don't know what's going on here. What was really meant to be communicated. This is another piece um, now at the Seattle Art Museum, which was believed to have been carved by Kajas Duakch. Similarly, this item, which is in the book Tangible Visions, another uh, so-called shamanistic item, which also uh, has similar attributes. I guess you could say in the face there, in the upper ear, you could go back to this face and see similarities with the mouth especially the sides of the mouth. Back to the top of this figure, you could also see similarities, right? Also, one thing I just wanted to note uh, before we move on is the paint in the center of that face. See that square? I also apologize, this was so this was taken from uh, Time Magazine. Not Time Magazine, but a Time book. So I'll say that in the attempt, we are at a very fortunate time where we have books like, uh, I mean, Tangible Visions. This one uh, is blurred out, but um, hopefully you can see. Tangible Visions. It's a very expensive book, probably $300, but uh, the libraries have it. And then this, Where the Power Is, Jordan Wilson, Karen Duffick, Bill McLennan, who worked on uh, Transforming Image. And we have good books coming out that give indigenous perspectives. But some of the better photos might be in these kind of arbitrary books, um, and which have like very questionable attribution. And we don't know if whatever they're saying is correct, and this is a situation that kind of afflicts all of us trying to learn and regain towards some goal of resurgence. So we haven't heard from Steve yet, but this is another piece that I was going to ask. Is there any kind of similarity? This is Ch These are kind of notable for Chinese coins in the eyes. Um, so obviously there was, it was post some kind of contact or what happened? Um, you know, we know that a lot of metal and knives and Ainu carving is one instance where in Japan is one place where you have hook knives as uh, part of their traditional practice. And we know that even in the book Tlingit Indians, um, the Emmons book, there's a question of the current formation of Tlingit people being formed by um, people coming from inland, meeting people who came in from the sea. So were those people who like came on a large ship or shipwreck, you know, there are a lot of, there are questions of that, even in historical records back then, when that was being recorded, like in the late 1800s. So we don't necessarily know when, although someone could probably, uh, a Chinese, um, our historian could probably look at these and articulate exactly when, right? Uh, this was another um, example from the Wrangell House Post to articulate why that Donald Ellis oyster catcher rattle would have been done by Kadis Duakch. This is another piece from uh, Transforming, I mean, sorry, Tangible Visions. Uh, from the Smithsonian. I believe could be wrong. Um, but I think there's a question here of if this is the shamanistic piece, what is the impetus for something like this? Um, 
and you could say like you could say it's spiritual or transformation or something like that but what is the artist's impetus in creating something like that and is there something that can be from my perspective um is there something that can be extrapolated and expanded and applied a kind of activity or mode of construction um a kind of enthusiasm even that could be applied to people making art today because these in some ways connected to their culture right what? so what would be a kind of analog of connection what would be um a way of doing that today that would actually have a power to affect us in everyday life or in special ways in the in a similar way that that affected those people we may have steve back with us we do oh that'd be amazing <laughs> i don't know what happened first the wi-fi died and then zoom wouldn't load <laughs> technology is great until it's yeah. not so <laughs> I love it when, it when it works we're glad to have you back yeah so uh let, let me see how do i recap here i'm just going to go back uh quickly and we can kind of see the trajectory of, of some of the things that i was talking about in terms of yeah, attribution. All good stuff yeah um this is kind of a fluid um slideshow i think there's a lot of reason to go back and forth um but this piece in particular i read the description um on the website i didn't get into the notes that you had provided for this piece um but yeah it went it's pieces like this go for a tremendous sum of money correct yeah i don't know what the final price was on that but i'm sure it was substantial <clears throat> talking millions i think well six figures anyway yeah that's why um, i don't own any of them so we went into this uh yeah i was i was thinking about this attribution and the tensions around attribution and the kind of contribution that Bill Hull made to that and the like the pros, the benefits of doing so. And I was also talking about, um, or just thinking aloud about questions around, is there any limitation or is the, what, what would be an error if pieces were erroneously attributed to a single person? I'm not saying that you in any instance have done that, but um, that, that's also a question for the the class um later on okay um this piece is interesting because it's very asymmetrical right could you repeat to, the uh, question <laughs> oh uh i might at the end but i i'd been kind of talking about what are for for artists coming up today yeah how might attribution um or desires for that to nail it things down to a single artist um, narrow possibilities i think in this case like the more we attribute to cottage to watch the more you see the incredible range that a single artist might have right yeah when you figure he probably operated over a period of maybe 50 years um don't have any the only thing we know about his life was that he was a <clears throat> a stikin kick study um and my guess is that his earliest work um uh, was probably is is i think datable to about the 1780s by comparing known works of his with others particularly outdoor works to outdoor poles that and comparing his earliest ones with uh poles from the same village site even 
with a similar degree of weathering. So there are poles that say we're standing in old Kassan, as was one of his. Um, and the, those poles that were removed from old Kassan in about the 1870s, 1880s, <clears throat> and, and moved into the field of heritage, at which point they stopped weathering, right? So they were, and that was in 1970. So they were about 90 to 100 years in the weather. And by looking at uh, the condition of his pole that stood in the weather um, at Court Chester, what became Metlakatla, prior to that was Taekwon and um, was a Klingit village. And his pole standing there, if you apply that same judgment of weathering, had stood there for uh, at least 100 years. So that, that puts it back into the 1870s, I mean, 1770s. And so he might have worked on up into 1820, who knows? Um, sometimes you see people uh, who have, like Emmons, I think, and uh, uh, what's his name, William Paul, uh, in um, Barbeau's books, Monuments and Cedar, they, um, they showed objects that, of his work and said they date from anywhere from 1845 to 1875. And I think those are just way off. They're not really based on anything, but basing it on related objects, weathering for the same amount of time in the same village location, gives us probably a reasonable measurement to say that his earliest work was probably in the 1770. And uh, this is from the book Faces, Voices, Dreams. Yeah. Uh, 1987, which hopefully you all have in your um, your library. Right. And uh, from Takwan to Kluckwan was this uh, essay from 1987 that Steve um, demonstrated. Um, that Some of it which was... it contains speculation on his identity because I had no idea. It was only much later that uh, <clears throat> real solid references to his name and his origins came to the surface. Mm -hmm. Largely out of a shoebox in the uh, uh, Philadelphia Museum. Literally a shoebox. So yeah, maybe you could tell us a little bit about this. Uh... Well, certainly I think it's um, not too difficult to see some similarities between the rattle on the left and the one we we're just looking at. I think okay. um, the first one that we we're looking at, the really asymmetrical one, had um, a lot of uh, stylistic features that are directly comparable to ones in, say, the Shapes House, or perhaps even the uh, Wheelhouse and Tuckwan. And so it can be pretty solidly attributed to him. And this one on the left, uh, just in general stylistic approach, and uh, the eyes of this figure, the painted uh, crescents at the back of the mouth, the style of the frog, uh, and so on, I have some similarities to, and even these little fish, what is that, a fish club he's holding? It's hard to figure out what that's all about. Maybe it's just the fish. But at any rate, um, that one's pretty 
directly comparable. And if you look at the uh, flat design on the salmon on the other rattle, it's very comparable to uh, this work right here. So at any rate, so then this one is a step further out. So is that the same person's work or not? Well, it's a little harder to say. Um, You're talking about the one on the right? The one on the right, yeah. It's a little too harder to say for sure it's the same person's work. I think there's some strong possibility. But if we could see the, the belly side, that might tell us more as well. But certainly there are some similarities. You're, analy you're analyzing the form line style too, which I referenced briefly as like right. fairly efficient form line, broader. Yeah. Broader line. And there's there are some things that um, show up on the rattle that show up on these, for example. Um, and then, yeah, so there's that that little face in the uh, octopus face. And it certainly has some similarities to this. The strength of the little beak, uh, the, the depth of it, um, and so on like that. And then the same with... And then to zoom on ahead, this is the for, some of the form line. Right. So this work on that fish, particularly this square corner where these two tertiary issues come together as a square corner. And he did that not all the time, but a lot. And he did the exact same thing here, although the splits in the opposite direction. There are two tertiary uh, spaces there and where the two come together instead of a rounded corner, like there are on the outer edges, it's a square corner. And that's the same as this. So that, that's a strong indication. And also the inclusion of the maxillary bone on the fish, which he did with some regularity. Now that detail was from this piece on the left, right? Which you, uh, or no. It wasn't from that piece. It was but, from uh, another one of these, yeah. A different one of those, yeah. Yeah. Which and you this, this certainly correct uh, made the copy by, by measuring directly off the original. So and I mentioned while you were off the while you lost connection that I had thought that you had intentionally kept a, a little asymmetries from the measurements. Is that correct, or did you kind of split the difference in terms of symmetry? Well, um, house posts. Uh, yeah, on the. Um, the households were pretty closely symmetrical to begin with, yeah. but I thought it was important to reproduce if it were, if there were asymmetries of one kind or another. Uh, yeah. I thought it was important to reproduce those. And, and one type that showed up was you see up here he's wearing this uh, dogfish headdress, right? Yeah. So there's the dogfish's mouth dogfish's tail, the asymmetry of the tail hanging over the shoulder, and then these pectoral fins on the dogfish. And there's a circle relief inside that secondary U-shape within the pectoral fin. And on one side, that little circle, um, there's a V-cut carved around the edge of the circle. And then the center of the circle was carved into a rounded dome, which is one way that people do that. Same thing with this circle down here. And on the other side, you can even see it. On the other side, there's just the V cut and the center of the circle is flat. Same with this one here, see? So it's almost like there were two different people working at the same time doing the same work or at least a certain amount of it, you know? because um, it's hard to see why a single artist would make those so different on each side. 
Do you all think the possibility of boredom or just wanting to well, mix that, it up? That exists. It certainly <laughs> exists, but it's consistently one way on one side and the other way on the other side. So go figure. Yeah. I was but also then, uh, interested in this kind of idea that this this piece or these rattles also kind of bridge a gap between and i think this is also doing it too of this piece on the right were carved by kata stuart as well kind of bridging some kind of gap between these secular crest representations which of course were not entirely secular but um and also shamanistic items which is more affiliated or attributed right. to the oyster catcher rattles and then the kind of raven rattles are then a little bit different right I saw Tim's question about an apprentice pop up. Yeah, I think that's possible that there was someone else working with him to accomplish this, at least to maybe not in the final finish, because you really couldn't see any difference in the finished surfaces, one side to the other. But that was certainly a, a distinct difference. So there might have been an apprentice involved at some point. But it's it's probably a pretty good bet that this is from the same carver. I mean, if you you know look at his uh, the digits on his I hate to call them hands because he's not really entirely human, but um, just the way that they're there's a straight cut and then rounded over digits uh, and. Um, feet are quite different, so we can't use that. But the, the position of the hands is similar, even though he's actually holding onto the shoulders of this small yake figure here. Um, whether that's a bear or not, it's really hard to know. The frog we can make out, certainly. And the frog coming out of the mouth of this figure and this frog coming out of the mouth of the main figure and its feet in the ears of the one below. Now, I have to admit that that's something that I filled in because on the original, these ears were added on. There was a straight cut there and a little shelf so that those were separate pieces of wood, the ears that were attached and they were nowhere to be found. They were centuries gone so uh I had to I had to put something in those ears and i thought it would be appropriate to put the feet of the frog so i did <clears throat> and then in something else that he did a similar thing showed up so i felt like it was the proper resolution so then the the character of these guys coming over and around this and this is a shaman's grave guardian it's what its uh, purpose was. And it was up uh, near Dry Bay, the Akitat area, that way, up that way. And this little froggy like, uh, or whatever it is, headdress that he's wearing, even has a similarity to uh, the attitude of this, if not the technical detail of it. Um, and this. This face can be more closely compared to other faces that he carved, like there's ones on the uh, uh, Kukwan post that are more mask-like humanoid faces where these are really totem pole faces, all the ones on these posts. How about this one? Now, I don't know who made that one. I don't think it's the same guy. All right, we'll skip that. <laughs> we'll leave it. One more look. All right. Yeah. It's a also, nice... a grave, also a grave guardian figure, apparently. All right. right. Same right. kind of thing. But both the flat design and the uh, sculpture of the face show enough difference that it was some other old, uh, old period can get carved you know, maybe in the same time frame, late 1700s. So then, yeah, so then those two were pretty apparently the same person's work. And so what 
connects them to conscious to out. Well, the ears certainly, and the way these hands and feet are put in there are very comparable to um, other things that he made, like the uh, Sheikh's whale hat that's in the burk. So it's got little figures like this in the dorsal fin. And the, the hands and feet are handled in a very similar manner. Um, and then this one, this figure, he's got a strong humanoid face. And then lo and behold, the feet are coming out of the ears. So that was what uh, I thought uh, helped to justify my putting the feet in the other ears on the house post because he did the same thing basically here by having the figure hands, in this case, four digits coming out the ears of the raven. I can't see that uh, from the photo. Is that a mirror? Is that abalone up top just to kind of glare? You know, I think it is. I'm not certain. This remember sure. the other piece that had a mirror, what seemed to be a mirror. Yeah, mirrors yeah. appear sometimes. Yeah. And, and these are interesting too because each of the eyes on this raven at the head of the mass, have, they, all, they both have a hole in it, like it was suspended at some point. And there's the image of a little, I think it's upside down, bird sort of a stick figure bird etched into the surface of the shell on each of those eyes. You can't see it except in the closest detail shots, but it's interesting. And certainly the way the nostril is handled is the same on each of these. And uh, hard to know which came first. Is there a significant on this, piece, on this piece in particular is interesting because there's a hole drilled in the abalone, right? Which seems yeah. to be instance. There you can see the upside down bird, see? There's yeah. its head and the wings and stuff. But so how it why it was chosen to go in upside down? Don't know, but it's clearly most likely that it's recycled from some other object. So there was probably a time when that California abalone, which is what it is, California and Mexican abalone came up into Southeast Alaska. At first, there probably wasn't a whole lot of it. And uh, it probably took time uh, before uh, when the British and American traders started and Spanish started showing up and went out of their way to take things that people wanted. They, they knew to grab the abalone shells and so at a certain point there was probably a glut of it uh, where before it had probably been a rare object. So those are the only two pieces on this particular work. And uh, they seem to have been recycled off, off of something else. How about this one? Here we have these large ears again. Large ears? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think you were focusing on the kind of the profile, the, the mouth, the nose. Yeah, right. The, the roundness of the lips. You see how they're not flat? They round way over, in fact. And um, the wide open eyelid, you know, there's hardly any pinch in that eyelids at all. And then the way this, it's almost like a form line on the temples, it's, there's a separate ridge just to set off the cheek area, just like this would be a painted cheek design if it was, if it was two dimensional. But this whole get, what's this? Form Remind line us what's like this thing sweeping around, it can be seen on those other ones as well. Uh, remind us the scale for this one. It's fairly small, right? It's a yeah, it's a face mask size. Yep. I think I've only seen it in person once. So I'd say it was probably nine inches tall. 
And this was also attributed to be a shamanic object, right? By some. Uh, I think that's probably a reasonable guess because there aren't that many can get masks that aren't shamanic. Yeah. There are some, and not so very many. Now that guy's really interesting. I, I hesitate to put it in the same uh, origins. It's an, it's an outlier. The, yeah, really different. The, the lips are flat, not rounded. They have very, it has very naturalistic ears, which is true of some of his other work. And then these Chinese coins uh, with that came with holes in them like that used for the eyes is pretty incredible. I mean, that, uh, Carver probably saw some coins somewhere and thought, boy, I know what I'm going to do with those and set about making this mask for a place to put them. Well, I'm also reminded of this, um, which isn't in the slides, but this this piece of armor, which had Chinese coins, right? Which is amp was that right? Natural history. Um, and I, it got me thinking about other pieces that I didn't put in, but helmets, for example, other pieces of armor. Why are they? Why are shamanic items, in particular, culturally sensitive, um, especially when it comes to Nagpra? When thinking about the other pieces of armor, helmets, for example, which may have been used and then taken out of commission at some yeah. point during collection but that's another conversation which maybe we can save for for later as we keep moving uh how about this one well i'm inclined to think it's a different carver mm -hmm. uh just partly because of the the eyelids and the yeah. way the, the points are completely below the level of the iris in pretty much all of these. So if you draw a line from the point of one point of the eye to the other, it would completely miss the iris. And I don't think that's so common in his work. Um, but in, right. other ways, in other ways, it should. Well, how about this one? <laughs> Maybe a little too uh, close of a pick, um, but that, that's an example of a kind of oyster catcher rattle, typically right. part of the, the shamanistic, um, having the kind of symmetry and less of a kind of an active figure, which this one at the British Museum right. is symmetrical down the middle, but has a lot more activity in terms of story. Yeah. Great, right? Yeah, it's twisting the hair of the witch to extract a confession from coming out of the witch's mouth and the big, big belly. It's a pretty amazing rattle. Where was where the one before this? This one? Yeah, where is that? I've never seen that one. Before. This is at uh, AM and H in the collection. Is that right? Back in the story? Yeah, yeah. There are over, I think 10,000, 5,000 plinket pieces, tens of thousands on the West Coast. Well, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I've gone through their storage, but there's so much of it, you can't yeah. see it all. It's just amazing. But um, that has some clear similarity to a couple of those others. It's amazing the way um, this almost looks like a, the pins are on a halibut, right? And then yeah. there's actual little feet back here. But that was most. That must connect to this head. Eh? And then there's feet down below and an eye. It looks like a beak. Huh? Pretty wild. I can't. Oh, that's a reclining human figure. Do you know what yeah. this is on each side? Uh, I think it's a uh, sculpin. Was that what I profile. read? Yeah. A critter there. And another written. one's sticking out from Notes. under the reclining head of the human image. That's a that's a great example. 
All right, so this one in particular, this is starting to remind me just at the moment of um, argillite pieces, but just the kind of sculptural activity and oh, kind of dynamism and uh, yeah, wonder, you know, I start to wonder about the influence of even argillite pieces in this historical moments when they were being when they were circulating, or yeah, or I know it almost put put it in the other direction. I, I would say that this influenced the argillite because yeah, yeah. if if argillite didn't get going until like eighteen twenty. Yeah, uh, I would suggest that this is older than that. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of stuff existed uh, before argillite, but was there for the argillite carvers to incorporate. And it's so much easier to do some of this kind of stuff in argillite to make those big piercings and stuff like that, because you can move larger areas of material uh, somewhat faster than with wood. Uh, this kind of segmenting, you kind of see this, the striations on the tongue toward the handle. Um, you start to notice in some of these pieces. Okay, I'm going to keep moving. Above, you see a raven rattle. This is the photo, historical photo from the British Museum. I don't know if the, all these items are still in their collection. Um, but I just wanted to kind of give an example before I move to another raven rattle, which is apparently, um, I, I'm just thinking about the different kind of streams in which this goes. You know, you don't, you see raven rattles made today, I think partly because they were separated from shamanistic items. Um, you don't see as many of these kind of depictions or stories, I think, because that's seen as taboo or off limits. Um, right. And yet you can see the relationship of these to those. Yeah. But without the same amount of detail. So there's the famous um, <clears throat> intimacy or contact or sharing of information between yeah. the human and the animal realm. And that's certainly a shamanic kind of a uh, concept. But then these were more these were uh, more heavily used by chiefs apparently, which kind of right, right. So in the some, same way that some the point, of us did, or blankets did to, or frontlets to denote royal, some kind of prestige or status. Yeah. So for some reason, these took on that specific purpose as a chief's rattle, and. Uh, that's interesting in itself. Uh, this one is from, this one is kind of interesting to me because it has these striations or some characteristics of the of different kinds of piercings than a typical right. raven rattle, right? Right. Um, this is at the Museum of Anthropology on display. What's in UBC? Yeah. Yeah, MOA. It's also um, from the book. Again, I'll put a little plug where the power is. Where the what power happened? is, Karen Duffick. Uh, this is plugged last week. It should continue to be plugged. Jordan Wilson. Um, yeah, piece is kind of interesting. Yeah. Just in terms of trying to figure out what those, what those uh, items are coming from the mouth. What are the striations? Right, right. The right. fluid tongue, which is more. Um, familiar or um, practiced in these raven rattles. Yeah. You know, as different as that one is, though, um, I mean, I can see it being called a raven rattle because it appears to represent a raven and so on. But um, in, in many other ways, it's not like the rattles of the raven rattle tradition. It's quite different. And it's hard to know if that was just a, a departures uh, that one artist was willing to take, or uh, was this really set out to be something really different? Yeah. So it's those little heads that are the source of this, huh? Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, you can see it's coming out of their mouth. Uh, yeah. And then other figures catching or, right. or throwing them out. Yeah, these kind of... This is where we need the person who commissioned this rattle to come right. forward and explain that to us. And this was also something, just to quickly go back to the very beginning, this idea that um, it, when it said it, it's probable that these are all representations of spirit helpers drawn from specific visions experienced by the shaman. That's in the, yeah. on the website, Donald Ellis. So who was the shaman? Was Kadis Duakch to have a special connection with the shaman? Did he have a, a secret identity as a shaman? I mean, those are all, you know, perhaps yeah. not serious questions, but, are, but what is that relationship? Um, right. An ability to kind of move more fluidly back and forth. Um, okay, so I wanted to jump to this ama other amazing piece. Yeah, um, we're almost done with with slides here, just uh, to let everyone know. Um, but this piece is uh, in the American Museum of, Museum of Natural History and pretty interesting. It was also in the Objects of Exchange by exhibition by Aaron Glass. Oh, is that? Um, and it's in the catalog Objects of Exchange, which um, hopefully someone can post as well. And um, yeah, this piece I wouldn't say I had any kind of imagination that this was Kadis Duaksh, but I just started thinking about, you know, how these kind of styles de develop or, or transform into yeah. freedom to do these other kind of depictions and what this is. Um, right. so, let's, let's dwell on that for a minute. So yeah. what is that son of a gun? Well, is in the notes in from Emmons, in the notes from Emmons, there was some deciphering by some people that Perhaps, or at least this was Aaron Glass and um, some other people that he worked with, um, that maybe the language was connected to something in Simpson, like sand flea or something like that. Earlier, it had been thought to um, be a grasshopper, but um, because that wasn't a local or, uh -huh. you, know, it's, you know, maybe it what maybe it didn't necessarily have to have been influenced by some other insect, even though one could say that maybe the kind of ornamentation on this shoulder looks like it even had like a floral kind of relationship. Yeah. Um, but pretty yeah, these amazing. spikes on the back were pretty amazing. Right, the back of the leg. You think that would be sort of diagnostic as to what kind of, if it was an insect? what type it was, you know? Yeah. And then what's the, what's this uh, laying on the back of the body? Oops. Where's the top view? Right here. There it oh. is. So that's interesting. So it looks like wings, huh? Yeah. I'd say those were wings and that's a, a foot. And this is the back leg and the nails and the foot. Huh. That is so amazing. Okay, I'm going to jump to our last two items, two or three. Um, this piece is interesting in that it is a rattle, but has totally different uh, kind of iconography and kind of mode of manufacture and representation, if that's what one can Yeah. Um, what do you know about this piece? Well, I don't know much about it, but I've always had the impression that um, it was kind of a, we might call a last minute kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I was interested in this kind of provisionality or urgency that seems to be um, used that, that maybe this whatever that other what is it bone ivory bone or ivory it's hard to know which yeah probably ivory the ivory kind of looks like some kind of i don't know the size exactly but some kind of club or amulet that was maybe formally used for a different purpose that's what um, it seems like like this is probably a suspension hole 
Yeah. And uh, it was copper, sure. right? This is like formed copper. Right. Was that? Um. Yeah, and then how somebody came up with the notion to put it together so that it looks like almost looked like a bird rattle in a way with the beak and everything but, yeah. um, pretty remarkable okay we've we've transitioned this is an m and h i think this is also copper um yeah no, no that's amazing it looks like it, it was uh it was originally a something you know? Yeah, like a... God knows what. A, a different uh, implement, right? Yeah, well, like the volume, the depth of the volume in that copper is quite a bit more than the previous one. And the yeah. previous one looks like it was made out of, you know, just pieces and formed into that shape with a certain amount of hollow in it. But this one, it looks like the hollow was already there in, in the form of something else. I have no idea what. And then the two pieces were. Mom, that's a little loud. Um, fastened together. That's also in the MNH. All right, we've somehow transitioned from rat Cottus Duash through rattles, raven rattles, got a sand flea along the way, got copper, a little a different kind of metal work, and now we've transitioned to this other um, crazy piece. Yeah, that's an amazing thing. So this, what's the material? Steel. People have said it was made out of a gun barrel, but I don't believe that. <clears throat> Simply because how would you slice this pectoral fin free of the rest of it the way it is if that was a solid piece of gun barrel? But then again, how was it made? I mean, that could have been easily unrolled, you know, from a tubular form and the head is still somewhat tubular to begin with. I held that thing, but I don't remember what the back looks like. But yeah, it's supposed to be a, a gun metal or some kind of steel. And it's interesting, uh, I have a, a reproduction of a blunderbuss that I've been carving up and I did some engraving um, on the metal. Remind us, remind us what a blunderbuss is. Blunderbuss is one of those, uh, you always see them in association with pilgrims for some reason, but it's a short barreled gun, a uh, flintlock that has a barrel that opens up into a bell at the business end. And there's a lot of theories about why they're shaped like that from one to be able to make it easier to load on the deck of a ship, which is where they were often used. Or uh, it certainly serves as a, uh, uh, as a sort of a terrifying proposition to be looking down the barrel of something that's two inches across, you know, and, and, and any number of things, both solid balls and a collection of smaller uh, bullets, you know, round balls, or uh, people even suggest that really random stuff like old nails were shot out of those, but uh, that's probably a stretch they would damage the barrels is more than anything else. But so, uh, anyway, the reason I brought it up was that 
I found that the steel of the lock and the other and the, the hammer and other steel parts on that blender bus were much easier to engrave than the brass barrel was. The brass, or it might be some kind of bronze, you know, brass mixed with tin or something else like it uh, to harden it up. But it was way more difficult to engrave that brass barrel than it was the steel. So I can really see how this amount of engraving in mild steel wouldn't be that hard to do. I mean, hard enough, but um, the material uh, wouldn't fight you. Uh, one thing, this was from, I found this in the book that you contributed to art. Um, what is that? The, the North American Indians, the Thaw Collection, which is at the Fenimore Art Museum in Cooperstown, New York, right? Yeah. Which I haven't seen yet. Um, but in that description, it's written that the en enigmatic object is said to have been made to cover the original owner's deformed nose, badly broken by the stiff recoil of a trade musket, which became the source material for the sculptural work. Um, where does that story, do you know where that story comes from in terms of the the original owner's deformed nose and the recoil of the trade musket? No, I, I don't. And it's hard to imagine why anybody would hold the butt of a musket <laughs> on their nose unless they'd never seen one before. Um, but I don't know, that, that whole thing might be made up because um, although it does have a means of suspension, Mm -hmm. um, if you hung that on your nose, you couldn't see around it. So I don't know about that story. I can't comment on its veracity one way or the other, but it seems suspicious to me. I think it was just a hair ornament. It sounds like an amazing story. There's also, for those of you who can't see, there's abalone shell inlaid in the eyes. Is that right? Is these ones up here? Could be. I don't remember that. One way or the other. Yeah. And, and was these to screw it onto his nose? I'm not sure. The holes? Yeah. He's run a couple of screws into his cartilage of his nose. No. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, so that is that the that end of the roll? End of the roll. Uh, we can go back at any time. We can bring it back up. Uh, but I'd love to open it up to questions. And I see there's 13 questions in the chat division. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I I don't know. Uh, you know, perhaps Marnie or can help kind of bring some questions forward, or Absolutely. maybe there were questions that were asked. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, the chat ones are here. I can, uh, yeah, I can definitely, I've got the, the questions here. And then uh, any of you students, if you want to, um, if you have a question, put it in the comments or um, in the chat. say so. <laughs> Uh, so uh, first question, in, re in regards to the rattle that we started with, what would cause pieces like this rattle to be able to raise such a high price at auction? Is it because it was used in shamanic type ceremonies? Um, not necessarily, uh, although well, the shamanic connection might have had something to do with it, but um, it's also because um, various people, myself included, raved about the thing. Uh, and even on the auction site. So that, that would tend to pique people's interest if there were, uh, you know, people deep into the art tradition who were really impressed with it. Um, so Steve, on the one hand, you're, what's that? On the one hand, on the one hand, you're raising the overall value of Tlingit and indigenous and Northwest Coast art right. right and mm -hmm. on the other hand you're making it impossible for us to buy it back um, without right. an 
extremely close uh, relationship right. um, with Donald Ellis, etc. Right. Well, uh, so it goes. But uh, it's also because oyster catcher rattles are far more rare than raven rattles. Um, and I think there's not as many of them have ever come on the market. And so people who are the more serious collectors who really want to have a broadly based collection and feature unusual objects, I think that's the kind of collector that was uh, attracted to that. And then the, the price was just a, because it's an auction format, you know, um, it's, you never know how high something is going to go. I know there's been some real surprises in auction situations. There was a, <laughs> excuse me, <Mother. clears throat> there was a uh, helmet that came up at auction maybe 10, 12 years ago. Um, that, you know, it was a nice helmet, but somehow, a couple of people got excited about it and bid it up over $2 million. And I, th I think the estimate was maybe, you know, 100,000 or something like that. But um, the surprising things can happen at auctions. You never know. For me specifically, I, I'm very kind of interested in the way that these album items become valued because they've been part of the these two tracks that I mentioned earlier between the armor and the shamanic items, they're two items that have kind of been discontinued, although people like Tommy Joseph have done you know, amazing work in terms of continuing the practice and learning how those pieces were made and continuing to make them. And that has a lot of symbolic uh, resonance in terms of rearticulating our strength. But these pieces were brought out of commission, like after the war was, for example, the armor, they were collected after the war was thought to have been won, right? And similarly with the shamanic items, after the after shamanism was defeated, those objects stopped being produced, whereas people mm -hmm. still feel like they can produce raven rattles. So they're part of this kind of dynamic of salvage ethnography or salvage anthrop salvage mm -hmm. mentality that aim to um, remove the items at the same time or as a means of saving them, but also contributed to the kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of, um, you know, having the cult culture in some way ending. Yeah. So in some ways to collect that has a different kind of, it's interesting to me that it has a different kind of symbolic power that, that, that the collector is participating in that activity still. Yeah. It at was, the same yeah. time, like raising the value of the ob objects and the esteem. So, uh -huh. yeah, for me, those two things are happening simultaneously. Yeah. I see a question about uh, Taekwon after the Simchan or before. Uh, and it's from before when when, when that was a Hlingit village, it was called Taekwon. And uh, there are some early pictures of uh, there was a few poles standing there when the Tsimshan showed up. Pretty much uh, it had been abandoned after uh, the, and that was Sanya people who moved to uh, Tongas. It was the same people that once lived at Tongas, lived at Taekwon, and they were attacked by another Lingit group from farther north. Uh, some accounts said uh, from Wrangell, some said from uh, Tlaquan, and attacked the village for who knows why. But um, and after that, they moved it. They up and moved to um, Village Island first, I believe, and then over to Tongas. So, um, but that's the story. Tlaquan was the Tlingit name. Uh, it was it was said that that uh, the first rattle was recently discovered. Um, have you seen an increase in the number of of pieces that are you know quote unquote new or recently discovered? 
Uh, it seems to kind of come and go like waves. Um, I remember about, when would that have been, maybe the late 80s, it seemed like uh, everything that was gonna show up on the market had shown up. And then all of a sudden, but it never does. There's always something new coming out of the woodwork, so to speak. And um, uh, I don't follow all the, the market ups and downs and that, but I've become aware of them because I, I do some uh, explanatory writing and whatnot for uh, auction houses and for individual collectors as well. Um, I've documented, so to speak, uh, individual private collections for their owners so that they have a, a written description of what, um, what they have in their collection. Um, so in that, by means of that sort of connection to that whole market economy and everything, that's the only time I become aware of it. But it's always amazing when something new shows up because things that have been around for a long time change hands with, with some frequency. So um, those are ones that most of the community, so to speak, is, are, are already familiar with those. But there's uh, every now and then, like that example, there's something that nobody's seen or next to nobody has ever seen before that suddenly uh, comes on the, becomes visible by being on the mark. Um, or it comes out of the back of the Museum of Natural History where there's 5,000 objects that have never been seen by anybody. You know? um, that, I haven't been to the Museum of Natural History in a long time now, probably 10 years, but um, up as recently as 2006, um, the installation of Northwest Coast material there is the same as it was in 1910 when it was installed. So um, hopefully they've made a few changes, brought out a few new things and retired some of the ones that have been on show for the better part of a century. Right, because they started the the rehanging or the, the goal of rehanging that was oh, yeah. supposed to happen at the end of 2020, um, um, I believe, and got put on hold um, yeah. for uh, perhaps obvious reasons. And um, I think they're still working on finalizing that. Yeah. So it should be imminent in terms of, I'm curious to see. Oh, yeah. Uh, will be great. Out, yeah, again, there are. I think at least 5,000 Tlingit objects in yeah. the basements that are not on display. Um, and, you know, well, on the National Museum of American Indians the same way. I mean, they have uh, thousands of Northwest Coast works, and very little of it has ever been on display. I and mean, I remember going to the old Museum of the American Indian when it was on uh, 155th and Broadway in New York City. And uh, uh, at that time, the, the museum building was where, it was where it had been built in 1919 or whatever it was. And of course, the neighborhood had changed around it tremendously. Um, I don't know what it was like in 1919, but when I was there in 79, it was a uh, uh, Hispanic neighborhood. But anyway, there was the museum and uh, they had a lot of great things on exhibit. But uh, when that closed, not long after that, 1980 or 81, maybe the latest, um, everything has just been put away and there's so little visible in the, um, the exhibition area they have in the old customs house on Lower Manhattan, because part of the, uh, I guess the, the conditions of that 
museum going to become part of the Smithsonian was that part of the collection had to stay in New York. So there's a little bit on, on display. There's like one exhibit case of Northwest Coast material and things from other parts of the country and maybe even South America as well uh, in that customs house installation, but there's not a whole lot. So most of what they have is still invisible. And uh, who knows what kind of masterpieces and uh, hugely inspiring things might be among those. Uh, like that one rattle, uh, even having been in the storage collection, I never saw that one. So interesting. It's another remark from Tim, uh, that guy on the has five fingers coming from the top knuckle. Uh, no, it's not common for human fingers. And I think that's part of why it's easy to refer to that as a humanoid or a part human, part animal being, you know? And, I, and they put in those kinds of things to make that the case. And why the ears are so tall, uh, I don't know. I assume that's talking about that raven mask, forehead mask. Uh, I'm keeping my eye on the time. I'm seeing what uh, got about 15 minutes left. It looks like at max. Um, so I'd love to hear if anyone is there in the class and would love to ask a question. Stacy has a question. Oh, cool. Hi, Great. can you hear me? Yeah. Perfect. Um, I was going to ask, how do you prioritize what needs to be studied in a collection, especially if you're going to have the opportunity to go and revisit that collection? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, the trouble is, you go at some of those big places, you go there, and you have no idea what they have, right? And so you'd ask them, uh, like the first time I went to the um, Smithsonian and they have their storage out in uh, Suitland, Maryland. And right next door is the storage for the Museum of American Indian. But um, so I was back there on some business for the Seattle Art Museum and I worked for them and I took the opportunity to go to the Smithsonian and go to their storage area because um, on display, they have like one little glass case with a little bit of Northwest Coast material in it um, in Washington, D.C. And um, so out in Suitland, Maryland is their storage area. So I said, they said, well, what do you want to look at? And I said, well, you know, I don't know what they have. Do you have any kind of documentation? Of, well, no, we don't. Uh, okay, then I'd like to see... Uh, anything that came from Wrangell. I was living in Wrangell at the time. And uh, well, they said, we can't search on that. It's not set up to search on that. So, okay. And then um, how about, <laughs> they're trying to come up with some criteria that they could, uh, you know, pull stuff from it. I don't even remember what it ended up being. Um, well, I ended up asking them for canoe models. Anything, any canoe models that they had, could you? And so they printed out a, a bunch of stuff that showed what room, what case, what shelf. Each of these various might have been a dozen, a couple of dozen canoe models. And they were all very interesting to see. And they were all in different places. And every time you opened up a cabinet door, to look at a canoe model, there was all this other stuff. There was baskets and other kinds of carvings and whatnot. I don't know what kind of sense uh, a person could make of the way they had it stored, but I think that's a common problem in museums. Yeah, I think in every instance, you know, these institutions are different and some have their catalogs laid out and searchable, right. but of right. course, then you have to navigate the like A and H has an extensive catalog, but um, one has to become familiar and take the time to kind of work and figure out what they can access. And a lot of times, these institutions also are working to revamp their collect their 
their interface, but you don't always know that at the time to what degree they're intending right. to re revamp it. Um, so yeah. I think also another aspect is a lot of times you go into a collection, it becomes overwhelming. Like say you do, say you do go to an institution that wants you to list 20 items and you have to pick those out and they lay them in a room. Others allow you to check the drawers. Um, right. A lot of these institutions also don't want you to take photos. You have to right. sign a release not to take photos or share the photos. I, I feel like as a native person going in, like it's always important for me to as much as possible bring another native with me and just to have that support or any person really who can also help and maybe kind of be looking at the same time for something that looks interesting. Right. Um, that becomes important it's of course not always possible and the, and a lot of institutions just the the farther you get into this game of being able to leverage your your entry into the institutions they're going to want comments from you so like doing something for yourself is not always as easy because they want they're like there with their notebook wanting to hear whatever comments you have to say right. about attribution or or something else, your thoughts about it, which end up in a book later on, or who knows where, or in the catalog. Yeah. Um, so there's a, this constant collecting that's still going on. So yeah. um, it's tricky to know how to prioritize going in, and there's it's become can become overwhelming. And I think yeah. similarly, I noticed some questions in the chat about basketry, um, about prioritizing, like which uh, Justin had a or Kashayi, Justin Keita had a question about which objects uh, do we think deserve more attention for study? I think that's, on the one hand, you could say it's a, a huge question that maybe these understudied objects are now getting more attention, basketry, weaving, and we are very thankful for that um, because it counters a lot of this kind of patriarchal kind of um, thing that's been happening for so many years and still continuing. Um, but I also think that from my own perspective, like I just want to see something that's different, that changes my mind about what Northwest Coast Art can be. And so I'm always looking for something that shifts my notion about what is possible to make contemporary contemporarily. And I'm looking for ways to try to find bridges or kind of translate whatever the intention was or whatever I could say the intention was at that time. And I'm all, always looking for moments when there's like a, a productive misuse, like like the, the pieces we saw at the end seem like maybe they were made for another purpose and then reused. I'm always looking at that because I think that's our task as artists moving forward is the the intentions are not going to be the same so we shouldn't necessarily act as if they are the same we can't just make the same objects over and over they won't have the same meaning so what how can we transpose that onto objects that have a large degree of meaning for us now um, i think that's a huge challenge and so i'm always looking going into collections with that in mind yeah and you never know when you're going to encounter those really unique objects that fit you know they came from the same tradition right but they included a lot of uh real outside the box imagination like that insect on the raven route i mean you know all the time yeah and that insect that insect in particular like that was informed i see sid had a question about um they've noticed in their research they wouldn't know a question even a fraction of the answers had they not learned the language first um, so revelations about, I think when you learn the language, you have the possibility to discover something that actually may have to be discovered in the collection, looking at notes and trying to figure out what the potential language links are. And that's how that attribution of the sand flake came about, uh, later on by actually people who didn't necessarily speak the language, but who knew someone who was speaking the language and those meetings together allowed for that kind of knowledge to to kind of link back up together again. Yeah. Um, but I think the loss, the loss is so intense in terms of the language and there's so much work to be done. So oh, yeah. 
Well, when a lot of these museum collections were being built, <clears throat> it was in the late 19th century. And so you, people like George Emmons and uh, others <clears throat> who, um, who went out and they did everything. I mean, they bought stuff from individuals in villages. They took things from graves. They did all kinds of crazy stuff. And it seemed as though they were more concerned about numbers of things than they were about what the importance was, culturally speaking. So they didn't, they didn't assemble a, a whole lot of information about what this thing is and why it looks this way or why it looks that way, you know? And, the, and so there's museums are just full of these uh, orphan or less object where you don't know their story because nothing was recorded. It's really a shame. And the one um, contradiction to that is uh, Louis Shotridge's work at the University Museum at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And he, when he collected objects, um, I mean, there's even, you always hear the story of the old ladies who cried when he carried the shark helmet out of the house and cut one, you know, because it, there, it was leaving, you know, it was unheard of. Those things aren't supposed to leave. But uh, on the positive side of what he was involved in, there's a, there is that shoebox. Uh, the shoebox in um, Philadelphia has, he, he made these little half page formats and it had certain kind of information, the, the name of the object and what it was made out of, who it belonged to, what it was used for, and things like that. And nobody recorded information like that except him. And um, so, of course, it's been sitting in a, all that work has been sitting in a shoebox, literally. I think they upgraded it from the shoebox since 1979, but that's what it was in when I saw it. And, um, and yet still, I don't think they've published any significant amount of that. Um, so it, it's just one of those things that- you know, Yeah, there are, there are extensive and, notes, like when there are notes, you might not know that there are a lot of notes. Right. Or you may go to some place and there's no information and you may go right. there and there's like handwritten notes that haven't even been typed out yet, right. let alone digitized and made available online. Right. I see Christian yeah, yeah. has a hand. We have about five minutes left. Max? Steve was late. We got a couple more minutes. Hold on. How about, I have a question for both of you guys. Okay. The question is, what is the oldest piece of art you guys have seen? The oldest? The oldest piece you guys have actually seen or physically touched or seen with your eyes. Um, well, if we count archaeological material, there's a, a number of things that have been recovered archaeologically, some uh, at the Ozette site on the Washington coast, south of uh, Cape Flattery, Nia Bay. And uh, they were pulling up things that were, they figure three to 500 years old. So uh, there's those. And then um, there were similar wet site archeological efforts in Prince Rupert Harbor, uh, led by George MacDonald, the late George MacDonald, and other uh, Canadian academics who uh, turned up some really interesting old stuff. Uh, and I had some of those on, on my list of uh, objects to show for this discussion, but uh, uh, one of them, a couple of them, are combs, and they have this really embryonic looking flat design on them. And uh, they found lots of artifacts, bent boxes, other kinds of things, spoons, what have you, that 
didn't have any flat design decoration on them at all, or what they did have was geometric in character. But this one cone had from the same site uh, dated to about 1100 years before present, uh, probably by stratigraphy in the archeological style. But um, anyway, and it was the only thing that had any kind of two dimensional form line ish design on it. And yet it's not like any form line thing you ever saw, but you see kind of some of the, uh, the genesis of it. So there are U shapes and there, there are trigons, there are crescents, there are, there are eyes formed by, there, there's no definition of an iris, but there's a trigon on each side of a space stretching out into a point, right? So you've got the trigons and then they taper out this way. And that suffices for an eye. And so there's a really curious uh, designs on that. And then there's another, uh, I think it's a wooden object. It's the handle of something, but what it was pegged to has been lost. And they figure it was in the 2000 year old range. And it just shows a very simple uh, form, kind of a crescent-like form. And there's uh, something of a, not really an image, but there's a, a definition at each end of that, uh, marked by crescents and whatnot like that. So you get a sense that this is really an embryonic form of what expanded later little by little. And uh, you know, we look at some of the oldest historically acquired artifacts. So one of those is a, a little bowl, wooden bowl that Juan Perez, I believe it was, a, a Spanish sea captain acquired it uh, in an encounter with, a canoe, with canoes off of uh, the Northern Queen Charlotte's. And um, uh, that includes a little, uh, there's a little ivory pendant that a woman in the Haida trading party was wearing. And uh, also this little bowl. And that little bowl has, it's a, a human figure, a humanoid figure laying on its belly its knees are bent up and the feet are bent back against its own rump. And then, so it has humanoid feet and a humanoid face with kind of a beaky looking nose. And then um, oh, there's a wing along the side and there's also a, a, a little long arm and a humanoid hand along the side of it. But there's also a wing with little design elements. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, there's one ovoid and a bunch of square cornered U shapes, which are all defining strictly by the book of Holmes identification, tertiary elements. So there's no secondary elements on it. If it was painted, it would have been black and blue green, no red. So all these things, were innovations in their time. So one time, form lines were thick and heavy, and there was no concept of secondary elements. And then at some point, somebody enclosed one shape within another, and suddenly it, it took on this character of being a uh, another level of design. And the more that developed, the more other people did it and so on and so things you can see in the historical record, things that have been accepted over time and reiterated by other artists in different ways and things that you saw at once and you never saw it again. <laughs> so uh, there's all the time been change and innovation going on and some of it 
is absorbed into the tradition and some of it never was. We need to wrap up, but I just wanted to hear real quick, Jackson, do you have a <laughs> one minute or less answer? <laughs> I can try. I also do not have a straightforward answer to that question. I think okay. perhaps because I haven't hung out with the, uh, the archaeologists enough. Um, my experience with the oldness has to do with being in institutions or museums and realizing that some pieces, there's a lot of question or uncertainty. I'm not talking about like tens of thousands of years ago, but in terms of more relative uh, dates, more closely, closer together about whether or not this was an old object or a newer object. And a lot of times it is obvious just due to the paint or et cetera. Right. And sometimes... Um, there's an initial confusion that a uh, piece is older because it seems more primitive or crude. And hearing Steve speak about, um, yeah, that's something I I kind of think about a lot in terms of how can one decide in every instance, is that equally applicable, whether or not there is that um, alignment with something being old and primitive. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Think about but, the oscillation. Yeah. Uh, that you mentioned, Steve, the, um, that maybe things happen in waves and at different periods, of course, we can see it and more recently that there were losses, uh, apparently, and then so-called Renaissance. Um, so, yeah, I think about that being applied to older periods as well. We'd re we really don't know. Um, yeah. And that makes it interesting for me to think about that in the current yeah. period. What does it actually mean to develop what things need to be absorbed that aren't absorbed or what can grow when things are narrowed and you have this kind of terminal addition of something that can later be incorporated into evolution or that is completely discarded as you were mentioning steve so those are kind of things that i think about like how can things be stretched to the where you know maybe they'll be incorporated later on but maybe not but that's okay one last question how many um how many serious Northwest Coast art collectors do you guys personally know? People that go to these auctions and collect these pieces. How many do you guys personally know? I don't not know. So, not so very many. Uh, uh, and and it's, a change, it's a changing group all the time because uh, they, they live their lives and they pass on, as a matter of fact. So um, some of them change their interests and they go to collecting something else. So it's really, uh, it's a constantly changing group. And um, I don't, I've never gotten to know any more than uh, half a dozen of them at a time. And every 10 years or so, it's a different half a dozen people. So that's my answer. <laughs> they, be, they become conduits for um, institutions. At, at different points or sometimes removal of objects from institutions um, depending so I'm, I'm a little more familiar with institutions at this point than individual collectors well we will wrap things up tonight thank you both so much for your time for sharing your knowledge with us it was uh it was a wonderful conversation uh for sorry the, for the technical uh, difficulty <laughs> oh it happened steve i know <laughs> we've all experienced it uh, our next History of Northwest Coast Art Speaker Series presentation is coming up in March, on March 23rd, and that will be Israel Shotridge and Emily Moore. So definitely uh, tune into that uh, Wednesday, March 23rd. But otherwise, thank you all for joining us tonight, and we hope you have a very good night. Steve Brown, Jackson Paulus, thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Have Thank you guys night. so much. Cheers. Yeah, good on cheese.